She's gone. She went on a bike ride.
you ever talk to your boss? We were busy today, and she's a little stressed out right now because of that stuff that's been going on. I told you what happened tonight. So what? Monday night. This professional store and stole six thousand dollars worth of butter. Really? They also hit Denver. All the Omaha stores. Um, yeah, we had a team that did it? We had a bunch of Spanish people. Uh, seven of them. Like, a woman would be at eight. Um, the other guy, 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 the they six thousand plus for the five. That was just our store. They're not cross federal lines. Yeah, they like they hit all the Omaha stores, um, Denver. Yeah, they're at Grand Theft over six thousand bucks. That was just a nice little wall. So yeah, she's kind of stressed out right now. I was probably I. I so she well, she's stressed out because it happened. Not only she's stressed because she's not worried about her job, she's stressed because she's pissed. Yeah. She's also pissed that no employees needed that night. Nobody needed the next day. 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 Nobody Left the drop too. Uh, paying people fifteen dollars an hour, they're not going to give a shit. That's the reality. Right. I have a game. Uh, what are you trying to do? Well, it's actually more that we can't watch the game. Ah, uh, we're going to get some ready soon. Yeah. Okay.
What's going on up here? Well, we better not be screwing around. That's all I got to say. Okay. Thank you. 
Get some sun. We're gonna get some sun this weekend. I'm pumped. We are. I'm going shooting on Saturday. Do you guys shoot? Anybody shoot? Guns? No. I'll be back. I live out west. We all shoot guns out there. Yeah. Blow some stuff up. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Take your aggression out on a watermelon. All right. <clears throat> well, here we are. Uh, class eight. We're gonna finish up the second part of the uh the telecommunications domain so we get through that that'll be pretty easy a lot of basic stuff still you know if you're uh network people then you shouldn't have any problem also i think i also added a quiz uh pretty sure so this is what we talked about last week or tuesday holy crap last week three weeks ago uh network architecture and design fundamentals oh, saw, oh you guys probably noticed so missing a lot faster now. You did say what? every time you were going to look different. Okay. You haven't, you haven't disappointed. I gave the presentation yesterday in social engineering. And I walked up yeah. to our group at uh, Tech Pulse. You guys ever been to Tech Pulse? It's a. Maybe. Like, I don't know. Uh, St. Paul Civic, uh, St. Paul, not Civic Center anymore. That St. Paul place. River Center. River Center. Yep. Yeah, and I walked up to our team. We had like six people at the, the booth and doing whatever they do. And I walked up to them, they didn't even notice it was me. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and then I went and talked about social engineering. So I can't say it. Uh, all right, so network architecture design fundamentals. We talked about all that stuff OSI, TCI, TC, TCP, IP model. Hopefully, I can talk about it tonight. I have a tendency to talk really fast about this stuff because it, it is kind of basic. So I think I can type as I'm talking through. Thank you for that. TC, the uh, paper that was pretty impressive. Like you said, I'm sure it's a smart guy with the long hair and all that stuff. Uh, so encapsulation. Speaking of which, just a recap on the encapsulation. Give me first. Give me first. Let me. Piece, let me. Um, it's being encapsulated down, decapsulated on the other side. That's just a nice diagram that shows where we're driving home uh, on Tuesday. I want to call. Uh, we get into a quiz. So, you guys, remember cryptography? That was last oh, no. Thursday, oh, yeah. I think. We went through cryptography. So I'm gonna bam and bam. Get going. I literally have had no time. So if a crypto system is using a key size of eight, what is the key space size? 32, 256, 16, or 64? I sent it to you. Well, so okay. if the key right. size is eight, uh, that means that it's eight bits. It's on or off. So two to the eighth is what it ends up being. 256. Yep. 258, 256. So two times two times two times two, eight times. Should come up with 256. Uh, that's why it's kind of a good refresher to skip a class and then bring this back a little bit. Ooh, somebody else is coming. He, see, I saw him at the. Uh, that, yep. So, which of the following is a requirement for a secure Vernum cipher? Do you remember which one the Vernum cipher is? Mm -hmm. It was that ugly looking machine, ATT Labs, all that stuff. It was a one-time pad cipher. So once you know that, then you kind of know the answer. So uh, A, the pad must be used one time. That's that's the answer, or at least 
that is a answer. The private key must be uh, only known to the owner. That's not true because the other side would have to have that key also. Uh, a symmetric key must be encrypted with an asymmetric key. That's not true. It needs to hide the existence of a message that would be steganography, not encryption. So, A, yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are different binary mathematical functions. Which of the following is a true rule of the exclusive OR function? I remember the truth table. Uh, so same value, XOR, same value equals 1. Uh, that's not true. 1, XOR, 1 equals 1. That's also not true. A and B are the same answer. Uh, C is the right answer. Uh, 1 and 0 would XOR to 1. You can do this one through deduction, right? And get the, the right answer on this one. Uh, C is the right answer. Any questions on any of this? There's the truth table. No? Questions? Okay. Which of the following is not addressed addressed by the Wassenaar Agreement? Remember the Wassenaar Agreement? That was the replacement for the COCOM. COCOM was Cold War stuff. Wassenaar is the newer stuff. Uh, Products exported to terrorist countries. That actually is addressed in the last hour agreement. Asymmetric algorithms is also intangibles that could be downloaded from the internet, like copyright infringement kind of thing. Uh, that's that's the answer for Wassenaar. Remember the Wassenaar? Okay. Yeah, more, more so which of the following is a true difference between an asymmetric and a symmetric algorithm? Do you remember? Right. We, had, we talked about asymmetric, symmetric, and uh, hashing. Uh, symmetric uh, was, you know, uh, was an algorithm either working in a block or a stream, and uh, it's, it uses permutation substitution, you know, those things. Whereas the asymmetric algorithm uses a one-way either a logarithmic function or, you know, factoring really large, large prime numbers. And then we had the elliptic curve one too. Uh, so those, that's, you know, that's the, if I know that difference already, then I, you know, when I read the answers, I should be able to find it here. Uh, so a, asymmetric algorithms are best implemented in hardware uh, and asymmetric in software. It's both asymmetric. They actually both, I don't know, but they both work really well on hardware. So, it doesn't matter if it's typo or not. They work better in hardware because it's a that those computations uh, are CPU intensive. That's why if you offload it onto hardware, it's going to be faster. Asymmetric algorithms are more vulnerable to frequency analysis attacks. <coughs> uh, that's also not true. Uh, asymmetric algorithms are slower because they use substitution and transpo transposition. Uh, that's they don't use those right. We already you know really the three functions that you need to remember for asymmetric algorithms are the factoring very large prime numbers, the uh, uh, expo exponent factoring large, lo uh, yeah, logarithm, logarithmic function, uh, and then uh, elliptic curve. They don't use uh, substitution and transposition. That's a symmetric algorithm uh, function. So D, symmetric algorithms are faster because they use substitution and transposition. That's the answer. Yeah, D. Cool. How are a one-time pad and a stream cipher similar? Uh, there's not much similar uh, about these. They both XOR bits for their encryption process. That is one thing that they actually do. Uh, but let's see the other answers. They are both vulnerable to linear frequency cryptanalysis attacks. Uh, maybe the stream cipher, but certainly not the one-time pad. The one-time pad is the only encryption that is computationally impossible to break as long as you follow those three rules. Do you remember what the three rules were? Yep, I only use the, the, the page basically once. What's, what's another one? Yep, I have to exchange the secret key. So the secret key has to remain uh, secure. And one more, completely random. Yep. Uh, but they, the way they work is they both they do both do XOR bits. Uh, not not vulnerable to frequency analysis. They are both block ciphers. 
either one or well actually maybe one time pad is a block cipher if you were to yeah but stream cipher is certainly not a block cipher they're opposites uh, they're both asymmetric algorithms that's also not true so a is the right answer here right both block and stream algorithms use initialization vectors uh, which of the following is not a reason not a reason it's, when I would, when I, I remember when I took this test on paper, I would underline the words knots because I always, whenever I took tests, I would get the knots and the, you know, they'd throw a knot in there. And so I'm reading it the wrong way. So that's, you know, when you take your test, that's probably a good tip. You won't be able to write on it because it's on your computer, but maybe you'd write it on the pad or something. This is not. Uh, but anyway, both block and stream ciphers uh, usually, okay, which of the following is not a reason they are used? They ensure that two identical plain text values result in different ciphertext values when encrypted with the same key. Uh, it would do that, right? Initialization vector <clears throat> would do that. Uh, they are used to add randomness to the encryption process. They also do that. They, are provided ex they provide extra protection in case an implementation is using the same symmetric key uh, more than one time. <clears throat> That's also, that would also help on that. They are XORed to the plain text after the encryption to ensure more randomness to the process. They're actually uh, XORed before the encryption, so D is the answer, right? Are you guys getting this too? So you guys want to answer this the same way? Okay. How are symmetric and asymmetric keys used together? So typically, you know, we already know this, that Typically, I would transfer the symmetric key with the asymmetric key, encrypted with the asymmetric key, that'd be the key exchange, and then I'd encrypt the bulk of the data then with the symmetric key because it's faster. Uh, so an asymmetric key encrypts bulk and symmetric key encrypts a small amount, that's the opposite, so A is wrong. An asymmetric key is used and then encrypted with a symmetric key. Uh, that's also not true. It'd kind of be the other way around. Uh, an asymmetric key encrypts the symmetric key. Seems legit. A symmetric key encrypts data, and the asymmetric key encrypts both of them. That's also not true, so C is the right answer. Which of the following security services are provided if a sender encrypts data with her private key? Uh, so this would, I'm assuming then, this doesn't say, if this is asymmetric encryption. So I don't know if, the, if somebody else has her private key too. So I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know if this is symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption based on that question. I assume it's probably asymmetric. Uh, if it's asymmetric and I encrypt something with my private key, then anybody can decrypt it, right? So the, with my public key, because I make that public key available to anybody if it's asymmetric encryption. So it wouldn't be confidentiality. Uh, it would uh, provide authentication, right? Because if I encrypt it with my private key, there's only one person that could have sent this message encrypted that way. Uh, corruption and integrity don't apply uh, because it, uh, it's not a digital signature or anything like that. <coughs> it mentions nothing of a symmetric encryption in combination with. So, uh, the right answer, if it's asymmetric encryption, would be B. If this is symmetric encryption, right, then it would be A also, right? So the answer here is kind of A and B. You just, the, the important part for you is to know, you know, the difference between asymmetric and symmetric encryption and kind of play it through mentally, right? Get that one? The veneer cipher, do you remember what the veneer cipher is? It's the 26 alphabets, that funky looking thing. Uh, the veneer cipher was developed in the 16th century in France. Which of the following is correct characteristic of this algorithm? It uses one-time pads, that's not true. It was used during World War II, unless World War II was fought in the 16th century, that's not true. So you get an old, maybe a little, a little history there yeah it requires a messenger yeah very little bit but you know you ever see those shows when they like uh jimmy fallon will go out and talk to people on the street or whatever and ask him questions you know it's like oh my god really 
So some people <laughs> would probably not know that. But it requires a messenger to take the right size rod to the destination. That, do you remember what that is? That's the side tail. That's not true. Uh, it uses a secret key. A uh, secret word is the key. That would be true. Right? What is Kirchhoff's principle and why is it relevant? Uh, the only secret portion to the crypto system should be the key so that the algorithms can be stronger. That, that, that's kind of what it is. Uh, but let's read the other ones. A public key needs to be associated with the individual's identity for true non-repudiation. That would be PKI, right? Public key encryption where you, the certificate has been signed and as well as the private key and all that good stuff. So that's not it. Uh, more than one alphabet should be used in substitution ciphers to increase the work factor. Mm, no. I mean, that, it's not the Kirchhoff's principle. One-time pads should be just as long as the message, otherwise patterns will be shown. That's, that's gibberish too. So, hey, yeah, that's Kirchhoff's principle. It's really, you know, the strength of the encryption shouldn't be dependent upon the secrecy of the encryption algorithm is the Kirchhoff principle. This one you can do at home, uh, you know, online if you are, you know, because we make these available online if you wanted to just monkey around. It's not testable. It's just kind of fun stuff. So the pizza is good every night of the week. If you use ROT7, just rotate the characters seven times using the modulus so you'll rotate around, whatever. That's what it looks like. But you can see the frequency analysis, can't you? That's why this is subject to frequency analysis. <clears throat> L's are the most common letters in the English language. Remember that graph that we showed you? You can see it just in this, there's two, three, four L's. Five, did I miss one? Yep, AOL. So yeah, subject to frequency analysis. This one, uh, using the veneer cipher, so you just have to have a 26, you know, alphabets in that table and then you could encrypt this one too. Uh, information security is fun and then encrypt it with rabbit. We don't encrypt it because we want everybody to know. So it's fun. That's what that one looks like. A uh, little less subject to frequency analysis. Well, we didn't have a long string there either, but you can play it out. You can see that you got GCG there for the last word. You know, F and N encrypted, they're completely different characters so you can see that the frequency analysis wouldn't be as successful on this one boom encryption that's it we're encryption geniuses now that is one i think one area uh where you'll have to you know kind of study up the um seems like from people i've heard fail the exam it's because when you, you don't you when you pass you don't know what your score was i don't think and you don't know what domains you did great on and which domains you just kind of skated by when you fail they tell you which domains you failed you know that they tell you the scores in your domain so that you can restudy <clears throat> so i've heard from some people that have failed that encryption seems to be a common one so all right so I think where we left off on Tuesday, we were talking about TCP. We were looking at a TCP header and just kind of contrasting TCP and UDP. Those are the two uh, protocols in the TCP IP suite that are kind of sisters or brothers with each other. They fight a lot because they're totally different from each other. Maybe they get along really well because they just complement each other so well. I don't know. But they are sort of, I sort of think of them as being opposites. TCP had the three-way handshake. It's reliable. It's connection oriented, all that kind of stuff. UDP is the opposite. Simpler, faster, cousin to TCP, no handshake, session or reliability, uh, send and pray. I used the analogy on Tuesday about the post office. You know, you send it and you just hope it gets there. You're not going to get any validation that it did unless somebody calls you to tell you they got the package or something. Um, as a simpler and shorter, but that, I always think of like, if you had to call me to tell me you got the package, that's the higher level protocol, right? That's another thing that had to do that. So that's an easy way to remember it too. Simple, short, eight byte header. The header looks, is over there. Uh, source destination. Zeros, the protocol for you know, where this is going or where this came from. Uh, UDP length, source port, destination port, that's, that's where it's going, came, came from, length and what have you. Operates at layer four. 
uh, lossy applications, applications that can support, you know, loss. Streaming audio can usually do this because you don't notice missing packets in streaming audio typically. Uh, yeah. And DNS queries. ICMP, that's uh, kind of the, the, the message, the messenger for IP. Uh, so on layer three, uh, helper protocol that helps layer three, does all the messaging, reports errors, all those kinds of things. Uh, used to troubleshoot and report error conditions. Every time you use, you use ping or trace route, you're using ICMP packets. Uh, no concept of ports, but uses types and codes. We'll see the packet uh, header in a minute. Uh, yeah, we use this a lot for troubleshooting. Very simple header. The type is going to tell you know what this packet is doing on the network. Uh, yeah, pretty simple. So what you're used to. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find ping and I can't remember the types. There it is, echo reply. I can't see it from over there, it's too far away. <laughs> but you don't need to know that. You need to know what ICMP is used for. You won't be tested on types, uh, you know, packet types for ICMP. Uh, so the codes you don't have to memorize. It's just good to know if you, if you need to. Ping, named after the ping, the same kind of ping, same kind of concept applies as, you know, submarines. ICMP echo request and ICMP echo reply, that would be testable. <clears throat> uh, determine if a node is up or down, but you can't, you know, fully rely on that because your packets might be uh, filtered, so they may never get to the host. And so it would appear as though they're down because I you know, didn't get a reply or got a destination host unreachable message. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean the, the host is down. We use ping. A lot of people didn't block ping in the in the in the early days, right? Uh, so you would use this to map a network and it was pretty reliable back then, but it's much less reliable now because uh, people are filtering out ICMP packets. Uh, so determine if a, if a node is up or down, uh, we, we did use uh, ICMP to map target networks much less so. It might be just part of the process a little bit, but we'll do other We'll do port scans instead, you know, and map is a better tool, you know, to figure out what hosts are up or down. Uh, you get anybody used Nmap before? Yeah, Nmap is the, the bottom. Uh, an unanswered ping, yeah, I mentioned that. An unanswered ping doesn't mean it's not up or down. So trace route, uh, a lot of people, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people know how trace route works, but the way trace route works is you essentially start with a with a one for a TTL in the packet. So it'll time out right away. The router then send you a message back. Then I'll generate another packet with a TTL of two. So it'll make it pass that hop, go to the next hop, and then it'll give me a timeout. So it's the timeouts that I'm seeing in terms of the nodes from point A to point B and a trace route. But it's using ICMP packets. Uh, so it's time exceeded messages that are what's actually displaying you know on the screen. And there's uh, those next three bullets are just kind of going through that process, but it's essentially you just can't keep in incrementing until you get to the destination and it'll tell you the route that you take there. Uh, that's still a good you know, reconnaissance piece for attackers because uh, a lot of those will get, you know, will at least get through to your head router if that's where you're blocking, you know, ICMP packets or to your firewall, which is good to know sometimes. Uh, it's not uncommon also though, we, ICMP is the traditional method, but a lot of Unix systems or Cisco systems or trace route clients, you can also do UDP packets. It's the same concept that applies. There's an example picture of how that works. So the first one, TTL1, router says time exceeded, and then we'll increment it to a TTL of two. Because uh, each router will decrement that TTL by one before it passes it on to the next. That's the RFC. Any questions on trace route? All right, application layer. So, plethora of app applications. Plethora is a really cool word. Uh, so, that we're not going to just have TCP and UDP. We're not just going to have ICMP and IGMP. Well, we didn't even talk about IGMP. That won't be on the test then. Uh, but there's a lot more protocols when we talk about application layer protocols. Uh, remember the mapping between OSI and TCP. So in the OSI model presentation session application layers are TCP's application layer. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that happens. So Telnet 
is one. And I mentioned last on Tuesday that we don't typically like the use of Telnet because Telnet doesn't, you know, there's no confidentiality in the traffic. Uh, so Telnet, just terminal emulation. Uh, it's text-based terminal emulation. Telnet clients are built into all the, you have to turn it on now, right, in Windows. Don't you have to like enable that as an option? It used to just come, you know, default. There's also a lot of Telnet clients that you can install. Uh, but Telnet servers, the, the important thing about Telnet, the important, two really important things that you need to remember for the test for Telnet. One, the port, so TCP port 23, and two, that we don't like it because there's no confidentiality, including the password, right? So uh, those are the two big things. Limited integrity, <clears throat> uh, secure shell is, is what we like instead on TCP port 22. Uh, we'll, I think that comes in a couple more slides maybe. FTP is another very common application layer protocol. We typically don't like FTP either, because FTP is all clear text also. Uh, we want SFTP, you know, secure file transfer protocol. Uh, but FTP, we still see it a lot, obviously. Uh, it's on the exam. TCP port 21, that would be passive mode uh, FTP, meaning we don't have two connections, two simplex connections uh, like we do. Uh, in, in the active FTP. So there is no real active FTP anymore. Right? Everything's running over port 21, but you would have 21 as the control connection and port 20 would be the data connection. And there's a, just an example of the socket pairs. Do you remember what sockets are? IP address port number combined is the socket, right? You can do a net stat if you wanna see what sockets are open on your computer. There's probably another command nowadays. Is there, is there people? It's still looking okay, good. I'm aged now. All right, so let's see, uh, FTP is used for file, tra I mean, file transfer. The good thing about FTP is it is TCP, right? So it is connection oriented, it is somewhat reliable, it's just there's no security built into it. So when I FTP to a system and I type a username and password, it's clear text, so anything. And the reason why clear text is such a big deal is traffic doesn't go just from me to the FTP server, right? It's hopping over you know, maybe a dozen routers along the way. So I'm trusting the admins of these 20 or, you know, whatever number of routers and the networks that they operate in, that there isn't a sniffer, that their networks are secure, right? So it's not just point A to point B, it's all the hops in between, you know, our opportunities for sniffing that traffic. TFTP, so TFTP is the Trivial File Transfer Protocol, UDP port 69. Uh, you, we've used these a lot, you know, for years, you know, for saving off, you know, router configs and switch configs. You just set up a little TFTP server and that's how you're storing them. Uh, simple. There's really, uh, there's no authentication. There's no, I mean, it's just send the command and the data goes. There's not much to it. Transfer files, also uh, bootstrapping. So diskless workstations, you know, might use TFTP uh, in combination with BootP. So boot P would be to uh, essentially find my boot image and then TFTP would be used to download it to the workstation and it would run. Uh, no authentication, no directory structure. It's wherever you've configured the TFTP server to store the files, that's where it's gonna store the files. No confidentiality, no integrity, very simple, very fast. SSH, this is our replacement for Telnet. Uh, SSH is also a suite, actually a suite of protocols. So within kind of the SSH is also SFTP, also secure copy, SCP. They all run on port 22. Designed as secure replacement for Telnet, FTP, and Unix R commands. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, secure authentication, it's encrypted. Um, so you can tunnel other protocols. You can always, you can sort of always tunnel protocols over different ports and within different applications, but it's not uncommon to do that with SSH. Uh, so tunneling HTTP is not uncommon, uh, which means you can browse, you know, potentially browse or do HTTP, you know, um, I guess you could browse the internet tunneled through SSH, but whatever. Uh, SSH version one has been decre uh, decremented, dec they don't use, deprecated, yeah, don't use it anymore, SSH version two. SMTP, POP, and IMAP, so SMTP 
even though we connect to SMTP with, as clients to send mail, SMTP is a sending mail. It's a store and forward send mail uh, uh, application. Uh, it's traditionally a server to server application, right? So SMTP is a server to server application. However, clients do connect directly to servers on port 25 to send mail too. But SMTP really is a send mail. Uh, SM, uh, simple mail transfer protocol, TCP port 25, POP3 and IMAP are two ways to get mail off the servers for clients. Uh, post office protocol and IMAP port 110 and 143 uh, respectively. Uh, POP3 is kind of a connect and download, uh, whereas IMAP allows me to kind of manage the folders that are stored on the servers as well. So there's a little more functionality in IMAP than, than POP3. Any questions on any of this stuff? You guys already knew this, we're good. DNS, DNS can run on both UDP and TCP, uh, port 53 for both protocols. Uh, TCP is usually used in one of two areas. It's either used for large operations like zone transfers. So a zone transfer would be, you know, multiple DNS servers for redundancy. I would, it would, it would uh, basically synchronize the zone across the DNS servers. <clears throat> if I haven't secured my DNS server well, I can also, as an attacker, do a zone transfer from your DNS server to my system. NSLOOKUP is a real common command that we use for that. You guys ever used NSLOOKUP before to troubleshoot DNS? You can also, you know, do an LS that's essentially a zone transfer, uh, which is good for mapping, right? It's good to know what all the host names are because those would then be targets for, you know, maybe port scanning or something else. To, uh, but anyway, UDP uh, port 53 is the, the traditional, you know, name lookup type operations are happening there. Sometimes if I don't get an answer on UDP, then my client will then try TCP port 53. That's kind of the other time when TCP port 53 is used commonly. Authoritative name servers provide authoritative resolution, so they're responsible for the domain. <clears throat> That's the start of authority in DNS, the SOA. Recursive name servers will attempt to resolve names that it doesn't already know. So recursive name servers essentially, uh, you know, let's say you queried, you know, frsecure.com's domain for google.com, right? frsecure.com's name server isn't authoritative for the google.com uh, domain. So it wouldn't have the domain records, but what it'll do in recursive queries is it'll go out and check for you. So it'll first find what server is the SOA for google.com and then query the, the google.com name server to get the resolution and then send it back to the client. That, that's a recursive query. Uh, and then there's always a cache, right? You store, rather than continuing to have to do that every time somebody goes to google.com, instead we'll cache it on the name server uh, for faster lookups. Questions about that on DNS? It's about all you need to know. You don't have to go real deep with DNS. Actually, you do need to know a little bit about DNSSEC, but that's that's easy too. Uh, there's an example there of a recursive DNS lookup. That's the tree structure uh, for DNS. So where it starts is the dot itself. That's the root. Uh, and then you have the TLDs, the top level domains. And then there are subdomains below that. Uh, and then the one up far on the right, if you don't know what that is, that's in at or ARPA. Uh, that's where I do reverse DNS queries. So I have the IP address. I don't know the domain name. So I would do an, an in at or ARPA lookup or a reverse DNS lookup to get the domain name or the host name for that IP address. Uh, and I guess I should say for the people online who don't know what DNS does, DNS resolves names to IP addresses. So there you go. DNS weaknesses, uh, the fact that it does use UDP, there is no authentication uh, in DNS. Uh, so you potentially could uh, forge DNS responses. Uh, you, what's more uh, common is a cache poisoning attack. So uh, this is the attempt, you know, when we maintain those caches on the DNS server to inject my own uh, resolution, my own names and IP addresses, really even more, inject my own IP addresses uh, for the names. Um, but most DNS servers are now implemented a lot better than they used to be, so it's a lot harder to do that attack. The fix for that uh, was DNSSEC. 
DNSSEC really just provides authentication and integrity. It doesn't encrypt the data, uh, the DNA, you know, zone transfers. It doesn't encrypt any of that. Um, but it's essentially it vouches that this DNS server is in fact the DNS server that's authoritative for this domain, right? And the records came from a reputable source. The problem with DNSSEC is it doesn't seem like anybody's really implementing it. You know, we, we do a lot of in our, you know, phase fours. Do you, how often do you see DNSSEC records? I think I've seen two. Two? Probably 50. Two out of 50, so we're at 4% now? Yeah. Nice. And then the DOD. Yeah. That's what it says. That's okay. Where it's used, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that if you want to know more about DNSSEC, I think what you need to know for the exam is that DNSSEC is meant to protect against cache poisoning attacks uh, and actually the other attacks to the, the spoofing because it provides that authentication that this, these records are actually true. SNMP, simple, ne simple, nipple, simple network management protocol, UDP port 161. Uh, important things about SNMP is I can... Traditionally, it's used to monitor network devices. If you've ever used, you know, PRTG or MRTG, those are pulling your systems. Uh, it's walking, we call it walking the MIB, the management information base. That's what's stored on the system. And that's how you find what configuration items you're going to be monitoring. You don't need to know that. What you do need to know is that SNMP is used for monitoring network systems or yeah, networked systems. It can also be used to configure networked systems. Uh, an SNMP version three, uh, version one and two, and two C, uh, either version one has no encryption at all. Two C I think has encryption, but it's weak and it's been busted. So version three is what you like to see. Uh, if you're not using SNMP, turn it off. Uh, if you are using SNMP, you know, change the public private keys from public and private to something else, right? That's SNMP in a nutshell. HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, HTTP, we use that every day. Every time we open a web browser and go somewhere, it's using HTTP unencrypted. There's been a big push to, the, you know, in the last, I don't know, 12 months to encrypting everything on the internet, right? Everything's moving to HTTPS, even, you know, public websites where there's really nothing there uh, to sniff, they're moving to HTTPS also. One of the big challenges that I'm starting to see with companies, and this isn't on the test, but it's just kind of interesting, is uh, it's breaking, you know, everybody going to HTTPS kind of breaks uh, DLP, network-based DLP, you know, where I'm monitoring the traffic flow to see. So, you know, the fix for that, which, you know, was years ago was to uh, proxy that, right? But now, there's attacks on those proxies, right? Anytime you put something in the middle of something, it makes it more complex and makes it harder to secure and it may, adds additional potential vulnerabilities. Uh, so that's, you know, one of the challenges of everything going to HTTPS now is you're, you're having to proxy all that traffic. Uh, HTTPS is the encrypted version of HTTP. Uh, important things, HTTP port 80, HTTPS port 43. Uh, how HTTPS encrypts it is either through SSL or TLS. <clears throat> BootP and DHCP, these are kind of uh, sisters to each other. Uh, BootP is, a boot, is the bootstrapping protocol. Uh, UDP port 67 for servers, UDP port 68 for clients. Uh, BootP traditionally is used to find, you know, diskless workstations or things to find uh, where their image is so they can load it. Uh, a lot of BIOSes do support boot P for that very purpose. <clears throat> happens in two phases. The first phase is to find my IP address and where my image is. The second place piece is to use TFTP to download that image. What part was TFTP? You guys remember? UDP? 69. What'd you say? Nope, that's uh, DNS. Yep. Uh, so DHCP is uh, more features. They, they both kind of do the same thing, but DHCP is a lot more robust as a protocol. Uh, you can assign a lot more features with DHCP. You 
all probably use DHCP or are using DHCP, uh, but it's used to configure a system. You know, it essentially, a system can, you know, if it doesn't have an IP address, it will use DHCP to be assigned an IP address as well as some variables, maybe DNS servers. Uh, used to NetBIOS, I was gonna say NetBIOS, or Win servers, but nobody uses Win servers anymore. Just dated myself. Are there Win servers anymore? Yeah. Do you guys even know what a Win server is? Do you guys remember? Do you guys know what Wins is? Oh, where is it? We never use it. Yeah, well, it was used for net, 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 It was used for NetBIOS name resolution. Yeah. <clears throat> Age myself, but you could assign that with DHCP too. Uh, so, design to replace and improve boot P by adding additional features allows uh, other configuration op options. Uh, you don't have to. We don't have to get in deep into IP address leases, but that's about. That's essentially how long this IP address will be allowed to the system. But before that, it it's continues uh, to uh, kind of refresh itself. We don't have to yeah, know any of that yeah. stuff. Really. Uh, systems can be configured to receive IP address leases, DNS servers, default gateways, a you know, bunch of other stuff. So boot P and DHCP. Uh, DHCP is much more common. All right, cabling. We're good with all that, right? Protocol yeah. stuff. Any questions on any anything? Uh, are you, anybody here like a network admin, like working with networks and kind of this level on a regular basis? One of your what hats? One of your hats. All right. You guys, because uh, really you don't, you don't really, you, you kind of take all that stuff for granted unless you're like doing some like, serious troubleshooting or you're doing some investigative work. You know, and you're capturing packets. Uh, you know, with Wireshark or something. Uh, simplest part of the OSI model is network playing, right? The lowest le lowest level. There's it's just there's nothing that happens. Well, there's not nothing. Very little. That's the simplest part. Uh, fundamental network cabling terms to understand. We talked a little bit on Tuesday about EMI, electromagnetic interference. Uh, that's the magnetism that's created by electricity. Uh, and what that can cause is it can cause that crosstalk, right? It can also cause interference, uh, but crosstalk is what we're talking about here, where the signal can jump from one cable to another uh, through a EMI. Attenuation, I mentioned before, is over time, the weakening of the signal, that's called attenuation. Unshielded twisted pair, the twists are meant to dampen the EMI, so the tighter the twists, the more resistant it is to uh, electromagnetic interference. Uh, but pairs of wire twisted together looks like that. Uh, more things, uh, categories rated by speed. I've got a couple of good tables. You, if you probably already know it, but if you don't, they're good tables to reference on the different types of cabling. Uh, CAT7, I think, is the latest. Cat five was the latest when I was actually a network admin, I think, or maybe, yeah, it was cat five. So, I don't know. Uh, cat six, designed for gigabit networking, tighter twisting, because uh, it also, you actually get uh, less attenuation for tighter twists as well. Category three was fast ethernet. It's kind of counterintuitive. You would think so. You have to actually have longer wires. Right, but it keeps, keeps the electrical signal in, right? The tighter twists, make it less resistant, you know, more resistant to electromagnetic interference. So it's not going to bleed as much, but it also, you know, keeps it more like focused. Here's some, there's one, this is from the Cisco. You can tell by the, by the way it, it looks. So cat one, less than one megabit per second. Cat, cat one was for uh, your phone cables. I don't know. You don't even see them anymore, but you remember those phone cables, very flat. Those were cat one cables. Uh, cat two, uh, four megabit per second used for token ring. Uh, cat three also used for, uh, really a lot, used a lot for token ring. Oh, no, cat four was token ring. Uh, but anyway, cat five, 100 megabits per second. You see the progression. This is a better, I think, diagram. It also tells you the, the links. Okay, so if you don't know that, you'll have to memorize it. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, coax cabling, uh, satellite cable TV. If you you know if you're a cable person, you've got this coming into your house and going around your house. Even going satellite boxes. No, not anymore. Now they're all HDMI. 
but we used to have them there too. More resistant to EMI, we have the shielding. Uh, it's the copper wire, the cladding, the shield, or the insulation, the shielding, and the cladding. Uh, higher bandwidth, longer connections, uh, two types, thin net and thick, thick net. You guys ever seen these before? That was just before my time. Oh, yeah, that's a vampire tap, so it'd be on a thin net network. It actually has pins that, that get that pierce through the cable and into the copper, and that's how the data transfer. Not very reliable, right? And another one was the BNC connectors, the British Naval connectors, which you, those aren't testable, that's just kind of cool. Share some history. Fiber optic carries light instead of electrical impulses. So both coax and uh, all copper, you know, it's electrical impulses. Here, it's uh, light. Long distances, no, there is no EMI with light. So it's, uh, it's hard to tap or hard to, like you can, there have been attacks where, you know, you, you put a cable, essentially a device close enough to a copper cable and you can read the data off the copper cable. You could also use something like a vampire tap, you know, like we used to do with the coax cables, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't probably detect, you didn't need to use something like a landscope or something, but you probably wouldn't detect that it was being tapped. So those are pretty easy. You can't really do that with, uh, with light. What you have to do is you'd have to splice the cable and then splice it, you know, splice it back again. Uh, so long distances, advantages, speed, distance, immunity to EMI, better security for sure. Disadvantages are cost and complexity, not so much anymore. They used to be glass, right? Now they're plastic. So when they were glass, it, it was a lot more costly. Uh, Multi-mode fiber, uh, one mode, uh, meaning light in, uh, I'm sorry, multi-mode, multiple modes, right? Multiple uh, paths of light. Shorter distances, you see them, the two cables that go together in a, in a fiber optic, that's a multi-mode cable. Single mode fi fiber, uh, just one path, long haul, uh, higher speed. Uh, yep. Yeah. Oh, and multi-mode, multi one of the things, uh, wave division multiplexing essentially uses a prism to break the light into multiple channels. Theoretically, there's infinite numbers of colors in a, a beam of light. so. Theoretically, you could have infinite um, bandwidth on a fiber optic cable. That's not actually, I mean, you can't actually, you technologically can't do it, but theoretically you could. But that's what wave div wavelength division multiplexing does is it essentially splits the light into multiple colors so that it can have multiple channels on the same light path. Uh, it's division wave wavelength. Uh, multiple colors and each color would then be a, a signal. All right, Ethernet, most common. It, you know, this is Ethernet here somewhere. Uh, Transverse network, uh, network data and frames. Originally, it was a physical bus to topology. So we're going to get... You already might know this, but they're going to get into logical topology and physical topology, and sometimes they're different, right? Like a token ring network was a logical ring of physical star. Right? So physically, there was a central location where the cables went out. So physically, it looked like a star, but the way it operated was it would go in and out and in and out and in and out, in one port, out the next, in one port, out the next. That was the ring. So logically, it was a ring, a token ring network. Uh, so you'll need to know kind of the difference. So Ethernet is a physical bus topology, meaning a bus just being a straight uh, line, and then you would tap into it. That's the original version of Ethernet. Uh, now everybody's got a switch, right, and everything comes out. It's a star topology now, physically. Uh, but Ethernet also describes layer one issues, like physical medium, the types of cabling. We've already been through some of that. Uh, and the frames itself. Baseband, Ethernet is baseband one channel. That's a hard one to see, but just driving home again, another uh, uh, this is a table, another table 
sort of like the ones we already saw, right? Carrier sense multiple access, uh, collision detection and collision avoidance. So carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Uh, first step, monitor the network to see if it's idle. If the network's not idle, wait a random amount of time. Uh, if the network is idle, then transmit. When transmitting, monitor the network. The difference between that and uh, collision avoidance um, is you wait for an acknowledgement with collision avoidance. Uh, collision avoidance is slower. It's more of a one-way communication, uh, whereas collision detection isn't. So you'll see collision avoidance now, about the only place you see it is Wi-Fi, wireless networks or collision avoidance. But you can see in those steps, there's a carrier sense that happens you know, in step one, uh, and then multiple access just means that, you know, this is a way we can all play together. But Ethernet is carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. So you need to know basically the difference between collision detection and collision avoidance. Older, other older technologies. Now this is kind of like, I mean, nobody's using any of this anymore, but it will be on the exam still. Uh, so ArcNet, Attached Resource Computer Network, and Token Ring, Legacy LAN Technologies. They passed, so your computer would have to possess the token in order to transmit data. So the token would go around the wire, and if the token uh, was empty, then you could take the token and transmit data. Uh, and then you'd have to wait until it became available again. Uh, so possession of the token allows a node to read and write traffic on the network. No collisions. That was the good thing about token ring networks. It was uh, more predictable. Uh, ArcNet ran at 2.5, a blazing 2.5 megabits per second. Uh, token ring itself, you know, started at 4 megabits per second, and the fastest it got up to was 16 megabits per second before it was kind of gone. Token ring was created by IBM. Uh, physical star, logical ring. So there was called what's called a, a, a MAU, a multi-axis unit, sometimes called the MSAU, multi-station axis unit. That was the kind of a, the hub or the switch in a token ring network. FIDI, FIDI's cool. Fiber, fiber distributed data interface. This is one of the first kind of technologies where we're taking fiber into, uh, you know, into practice, I guess. Uh, legacy LAN technology, uh, logical network ring, primary and secondary counter rotating rings. Now the counter rotating ring, the second ring was supposed to be for redundancy, but what most people did in practice is enabled both of them. So you had twice the speed. That's what most people ended up doing. Uh, secondary ring was typically used for fault tolerance. A single FIDI ring, FIDI ring runs at hundred megabits per second. So back in the day, this was pretty BA. It was very expensive. Uh, and if I was using both rings simultaneously, I'd be able to double my speed, right? It's, and it worked sort of like token ring in the way it worked. Use that token passing. If I didn't, if I didn't have the token, then I couldn't send. You could actually speed this up even more. Uh, there were implementations where they were using multiple tokens on the network. Uh, whatever. You don't need to really know that. But know, know the stuff on the slides and you're fine. The bus network, so the bus network, this was the old thin net, thick net stuff. Uh, not very resilient because if there was any break in the bus network, it, this was a logical and a physical linear topology. So if anything along the line was, uh, if there was a break in the line, then the whole network was down. There was no communication. Yeah, brings back memories. This is a tree topology. So uh, this, this would be a, in a polling type of network. Uh, this would be a mainframe, would be used kind of a, a topology like this, where there's one system that kind of controls all of the network. And then it would pull the systems that belong in the network and you got anything to send? No, okay, you got anything to send? No. That's sort of how it worked. A hierarchical network, the root node and then branch nodes, three levels deep, the root node controls all the tree traffic, mainframe. Old, I don't see it much. It's exciting or what? Well, I could make this more exciting, but it's like it's just not. What, do you have any ideas what to do to make it more exciting? Not really. Dance? Perhaps. Could watch a movie while we're doing this? Uh, 
All right, so there's the ring topology. This, there really were, well, no, I can't say there weren't any physical ring topologies, but traditionally the token ring uh, network was a uh, logical ring, but it was a physical star. The MAU, MSAU, that's the multi-axis unit and the multi-station axis unit, those were the kind of the central things that controlled token rings networks. I, you know, back in the day, token ring was very popular because it was an IBM technology. Uh, so there were a lot of implementations of this. And the star topology, this is what we typically think of. Uh, this is what you see in, in our ethernet networks today, the dominant physical topology for local area networks, first popularized, popularized by ARCnet. And it's what, you know, it's what we're all used to. Uh, that's just an exam warning to know, to know the difference between physical and logical topologies, right? Um, so if the exam is asking what topology is this, go back and make sure you understand the context for the question, whether they're talking about a logical or physical topology. Partial mesh and, and full mesh networks. A full mesh network is, you know, each node is connected to all the other nodes and it's a very um, resilient uh, network architecture, but it's super expensive and super complicated. So most people have a partial mesh network. So uh, you'd see this in, um, it's nice when you have multiple paths to a location. So if one path breaks, I've got another path to get there. Uh, so you'll see this in you know, a lot of real implementations. Nobody really goes full mesh unless you've got like, you know, maybe three systems that you're connecting to each other or four because they, it's exponential. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I've never seen it go beyond four. Uh, so we went to our technologies and protocols. So T1s, T3s, E1s and E3s, the difference between the T's and the E's is T's is US, E's are Europe. Uh, T1s are 1.544 megabits per second. Uh, oftentimes we'll just say it's 1.5 megabits per second. Uh, it's made up of uh, signals or channels. So there's 24 uh, channels, 64 bits each. So if you do 24 by times 64, you'll come up with something like 1.544. Uh, fractional T1s. So these are made for voice originally uh, and digital. Uh, but you can, you know, fractional T1s, we do use some of those channels for phone lines. So, you know, whatever I take out of that, out of that bundle of 24 for, for voice would reduce the bandwidth. Uh, but that'd be a, like a fractional T1 you know, implementation. DS1, digital signal one and T1 are used interchangeably. So are DS3 and T3, they're also used interchangeably. Uh, DS1 describes the flow of bits across copper. T3, 28 bundled T1. So if you take 1.544 multiplied by 28, you should come up with something like 44.736. We, sh we, sh we shorten that and say it's 45 megabits per second. These used to be super expensive. I mean, we had a fractional T3 at JASC software and we were paying, we got seven megabits per second. I think we were paying like $11,000 a month for that back then. It's crazy. Uh, E1 and E3, you will not, you, I, you would need to memorize these. And, you know, the thing is about memorizing, they're not all that practical anymore because not many people really are using T1s as much as, well, maybe they are, but I don't know. If you're not using them, then you don't really need to memorize it. Uh, but E1s, 2.048 megabit circuits. It's the same, it's the same signaling almost, uh, meaning the same 64 bit mega, no, bit signals um but it's 30 channels so that's accounts for the more bandwidth in an e1 this was all european so you wouldn't see this in the united states anywhere e3 is 24 e1 is 34.368 megabits per second okay any questions on that <laughs> all right frame relay Frame relay packet switched. Uh, this is a WAN topology, so wide area network topology on layer two. No error recovery in frame relay, so frame relay would always rely on like TCP, uh, IP, or IP for a lot of the error correction and stuff like that. Fast, 
uh, works kind of in two different ways. Um, these are virtual circuits, so they're not you know, physical. You have the permanent virtual circuit and the switched virtual circuit, not to be confused with packet switching networks and circuit switched networks. Uh, frame relay would either set up, you know, the permanent virtual circuit is that it was always connected through the carrier's network. Uh, and it was dedicated, so I'd always get the same amount of bandwidth. I'd get really kind of predictable uh, network performance in a PDC uh, frame relay network. Switched virtual circuits were set up, you know, kind of like a telephone call. When I make, when I'm ready to transmit data, the circuit would get set up. When the data was done, it would tear the circuit down. Uh, you'll see DELSI. DELSI was how uh, frame relay ne networks or traffic was identified over the carrier. Network was the DELCs, data link connection identifiers. Next up, 25, old, dead, gone, but you know, still here, I guess, on the exam. Older packet switched WAN protocol was very heavy on error detection and correction, uh, not, um, not uh, efficient at all. It was very, a lot of overhead with X.25. A cost-effective way to transmit data over long distances in the 70s through the 90s, uh, but then died out because it had too much overhead. Uh, global Packet Switch Network X.25, separate from, so there were a number of networks that ran over kind of the same infrastructure as the internet. Like Gopher, do you remember Gopher? Gopher was its own protocol. It was, you know, created at the University of Minnesota, and it died just not all that long ago, I don't think. In the last five years, there's really no gopher network anymore. X25 was kind of the same way. Uh, lots of error correction, lots of latency. Now things are happening with TCP IP. Uh, ATM, uh, I don't know if we see ATM much anymore. I can't recall seeing it anywhere for a long time. The thing about ATM, the most important thing to remember about ATM was 53 byte cells. Every, every data unit was 53 bytes long, which made it fast, right? Because you could make routing decisions pretty quickly. You wouldn't have to wait for all the data. It was, it was all very predictable that way. Uh, five byte header and 48 byte data portion. Uh, so you will need to, rem for some reason, I think you'll have to memorize uh, SMDS, the switch multi megabit data service. Um, that it also uses 53 byte cells. So that's ATM and SMDS. Now MPLS, <clears throat> MPLS in terms of like ISC squared testing stuff is really kind of relatively new, even though it's been around for quite a while. You don't need to know too much about it. It's a layer two uh, labeling. So it's the labeling itself that's important and how data gets routed and, and providing confidentiality of the data stream. Uh, forwards WAN data via labels, via a shared MPLS cloud network. So the labels is what keeps the data separate. Uh, many types of data. Uh, it's, yeah, anyway. Decisions are based on labels, not encapsulated header data, voice data, whatever. MPLS, the thing to remember about it, MPLS is the labels. Right. Labels are what make uh, MPLS work. You guys are all probably using MPLS networks, I assume. Probably have a carrier who's managing that MPLS network for you. Uh, in most cases, that's what we see. But it's very popular. Synchronous data link control in HDLC uh, high level or high speed uh, is the kind of the replacement for SDLC. Synchronous layer two WAN protocol uses polling to transmit data. Uh, not very nowhere anymore. Polling is similar to token passing. The difference is the primary mode polls secondary nodes, which can transmit data when polled. Yeah, it's been sort of replaced. It does, one thing that was a carryover for high level data link control was the NRM, which kind of explains the modes and how SDLC and HDLC work. For the test, HDLC replaced SDLC, added error correction flow control, and then the ARM and uh, ABM modes. You can read that part just as easy as I can. This is. Um, are we going to need another mode or HDLC? Yep, you are. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. For impractical real life stuff. 
dump it as soon as you're done with the exam. But yeah, memorize it for the exam. So normal response mode, secondary modes can transmit when given permission by the primary. That's the default mode. That's also the mode you know that carry over from carry carry over from SDLC. Asynchronous response. So if you look at the words, you can kind of figure it out. Uh, but asynchronous response mode, secondary modes can initiate communication with the primary. Asynchronous balance mode is mean that you can kind of well combine mode where uh, yeah. You can read it. I don't like reading anymore. I'm tired of reading. Okay, devices that we see on layer one. We've already mentioned this before. So this is, you know, we mentioned on Tuesday, you already, you might have already known it. Uh, but at layer one, repeaters and hubs, they don't do anything to the data. They, all they do is just regenerate the signal. So they're good for attenuation and not, not anything else, really. So repeater, a re difference between a repeater and a hub is a hub is a multi-port repeater, essentially. So repeater receives bits on one port and repeats them out the other port. Repeaters have no understanding of protocols that only repeats bits, uh, extend the length of the network. A hub is a repeater with more than two ports, so it's a multi-port repeater. Uh, they do that, they work the same way. You know, a hub receives it in one port and it'll forward it out all the other, and you see that if, if that network gets too big, you're going to have a lot of collisions, right? When we go to carrier sense multiple access collision detection, it's going to get to a point where nobody can communicate because it never quiets down, right? Uh, no traffic isolation, no security. Uh, they're half duplex devices, one collision domain. Yeah, that's a hub. We don't use hubs really in production networks anymore unless we're doing like a, an intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system. Something in promiscuous mode, we might use it if we're using Wireshark, you know, to capture data. Take it too fast, there you go. There's attenuation, right? The weakened signal, it's attenuating over time. The repeater regenerates it, everybody's happy. There are two devices, are bridges. Uh, bridges or switches are multi-port bridges, right? Uh, a switch does provide layer two segmentation or layer two isolation. Uh, a bridge itself has two ports. So you know, build that MAC address table. So uh, you know, say computer one on the left side, it's gonna communicate the first time it's gonna go across or before the MAC address table is built. But the bridge, the bridge will then know, okay, uh, computer one, you're on this side. Uh, computer three, you're on this side. So if, some, if computer four wants to communicate with computer three, it's not going to have to cross the bridge, right? Without that MAC address table, it would cross the bridge. Does that make sense? Two ports, MAC addresses are used. Layer two MAC address, two collision domains. Switch, bridge with more than two ports, multi-port hub. Sorry, multi-port bridge. Uh, best practice to connect one port per device. That makes sense. Uh, it's pretty much followed. Isolation um, by MAC address shrinks the collision domain to the single port. So there is still a collision domain, it's just one port. If I connect multiple systems to that one port, then all those systems are in that collision domain. Trunking between switches uh, just connects two switches together. So if, you know, you know how that works, right? VLANs, virtual LANs, and inter-VLAN communication. So VLANs are segmentation at layer three the switch would essentially just tag these ports or this traffic. Uh, for inter-VLAN communication, you need to have a layer three switch, or sorry, layer three router. Routers operate at layer three. Span ports, monitoring traffic from multiple ports is called a span port, so you can configure a switch to send all data coming in from whatever ports to the span port the problem that you run into is you saturate that span port and then, you know, you're just not going to get all the data. But mirroring traffic from multiple switch ports to one span port, span is a Cisco term. HP switches use the mirror port term. Uh, you would potentially use this for intrusion detection and prevention. Draw back to using the, the span port as that bandwidth overload. You've saturated, you've got too many, you know, you're, re you're replicating too many different ports to one port. TAPS stand for test access port, kind of used uh, sort of in the same way. 
Uh, you would tap into the traffic to see all the data streams. You might use this again for intrusion detection systems. Uh, fail open, it's probably a good idea uh, that the tap fails open so that if it does fail, you're not gonna interrupt network traffic. Any questions on taps? Routers, layer three devices, so we worked our way from hubs to switches to routers. Route traffic from one LAN to another, so inter-VLAN communications have to have layer three functionality. We're not gonna get into too much the multi-layer switching thing, multi-layer switches. That was so confusing when you know that first became a thing. Uh, IP-based routers make routing decisions based on the source and destination IP addresses. Uh, and there's an example in the real world. Cisco 6500s, which now everybody's using Nexus, right? My favorite switch in the whole world was the 6509, but now they're like dead. They used to cost like 120 grand. How much do Nexus switches cost now? Okay, 40 or 50,000. And out, right. I mean, just to get a 6509, just almost like the chassis with, you know, the Soup 720. It was like 120, you know. And then you'd work at like places like UHG. They'd have like four of them sitting in the storage area. Yeah. yeah. It's like, man alive. Crazy. Anyway, so it's, the point here is, you know, there's multi-layer switches now, right? Switches don't just do uh, layer two work anymore. Now you can, they can do routing. They can do... Uh, firewalling, they can do a lot of things. Uh, but for the test, understanding traditionally where these things operate, you've essentially just take the, take taken a lot of functionality and put it into one chassis. So it's not really even a switch anymore. Uh, different types of routes. So static routes, default routes, we don't have to pass our CCNA here. So we don't have to know the deep, you know, the deep stuff, uh, not even CCNA, CCNP maybe. You don't have to know really all that much. You need to know the basics. So static routes are routes that you would manually enter into the system or the device. Uh, routes to other networks, anytime there's a routing change or a system goes down or up, you'd have to make a manual routing entry change. So good for simple networks uh, where there's not a lot of changes happening. Um, default routes are routes where, if I don't know where to send this, I have no routing table entry, the default route is that's where it goes. Hopefully that node knows where it goes from there. Uh, so route to other networks that are not known, if no routes are uh, to the network exist, the default route is used. So there's a pretty simple, we got three T3s. How fast do T3s go? 45 megabits per second, T1's at 1.5, right? So yeah, so you can see that, uh, I think where we're gonna go now is uh, distance vector routing protocols versus um, well, maybe we're not. Oh, this is just an explanation of what we're looking at, right? So we're looking at the that network topology, fairly simple. So if there are things that go down in this network, uh, you'd have to, so you can see the routing entries, like from the data center, I have, uh, I don't know, probably routing entries for all those routes. Uh, and anytime there's a change, I'd have to change the route. I would know, I would have no idea if the T1 between office C and B went down, uh, and even the, the routing entry between the data center and office C, if that one went down, that doesn't mean my routing table would change potentially. Uh, so distance vector routing protocols, these are uh, really a hop count is the primary metric. So the number of nodes that I need to go across to get to the destination is gonna be used for uh, determining the best route to the destination. It'll take nothing into account of the bandwidth for each one of those hops. So it might take three T1s versus, uh, you know, four T3s, right? The four T3s will get me there faster, but it's more hops. So the routing decision would be to go on the three T3s instead. That's a distance vector, you know, decision. Simplest metric is hop count, number of routers to the destination, does not account for link speed between networks and is prone to routing loops. Uh, routing loops means that the network couldn't converge fast enough, uh, so things might bounce around for a while. Uh, routing information protocol is the uh, kind of the de facto one that we talk about when we talk about distance vector routing protocols. 
Hop count is the metric. It doesn't have a full view of the network. It only sees its peers. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have a, like OSPF has a full view. That's not a distance vector routing protocol, though. So, uh, convergence is slow, sends routing updates every 30 seconds, whether there's changes or not. Maximum hop count is 15. 16 would be considered, con considered, considered infinite. Uh, Rich, uh, our RIP version one was a classful. Remember on Tuesday we talked about CIDR, we talked about classless interdomain routing. Uh, RIP version two would, would support that. Use a split horizon to avoid routing loops. Essentially what can happen is you advertise that that network is down and then I advertise that it's up and now we've got potentially a routing loop or we'll never converge. Hold down timer is, to, is used to prevent flapping. So if it doesn't converge in enough time for that network to come up, uh, it won't continue to show that it's up and down and up and down and up and down. Things you'll need to know, split horizon avoids routing loops, hold down timers avoid flapping. You don't need to know the details of how, you know, the packet flow and what that looks like or anything. Link state routing protocols, OSPF is, you won't, we won't get into uh, EIGRP, and I doubt you'll see IGRP on the exam. EIGRP is a Cisco proprietary routing protocol, so it won't be on the exam. I don't get into specific uh, vendor stuff on the exam. Uh, but additional metrics with OSPF, open shortest path, path first, uh, things like, you know, network speed, latency, those will all be, you know, potentially accounted for uh, with OSPF. Routers learn about all of the entire network within its own area, right? So when you configure OSPF, you would have to assign an area and the routers would know about all the networks. You know, the entire map is built in an OSPF network. Routers send event driven updates. So we don't have that those updates going every 30 seconds. Fast convergence for OSPF. Um, for the more so, so for a small so you can see that for a very small network static routing is fine if the network gets a little bit larger then maybe rip is a better option uh, but as the network gets even larger OSPF would be you know the best choice there was a question online on why there's so much legacy right yeah um, I don't know I think it's to kind of build the foundation right? it does yeah you still see a lot of this stuff yeah, you do still see it. Well, in the in the um, the concepts still apply. Right. Yeah, even though the technologies have changed quite a bit, the concepts are still valid. Yeah, there's, uh, and I think it's also because for 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 a security person, it's knowing the concepts and knowing you know the the breadth of it. If you decide that you really wanted to specialize in network security, well, then you'd go deep in that. But for the exam, as a generalist, you know, for a CISSP, you don't need to do that. Border gateway routing protocol or border gateway protocol. This is uh, an exterior gateway or exterior routing protocol, meaning this would, wouldn't be something I would use on a LAN. This is something that's on the internet. It's, it's, it's for routing between uh, autonomous systems, which are essentially uh, domains of control on the internet. Uh, so the routing protocol used on the internet routes between autonomous systems, which are networks with multiple internet connections, has some distance vector properties, uh, but formally it's considered a path vector protocol. Just to add more confusion for you. Nothing about EIGRP on the exam. Firewalls, uh, you understand what a firewall does. It filters traffic from, protects, you know, essentially one side from the other. Uh, Filter traffic between networks, TCP IP packet filter. We've talked about packet filtering firewalls and stateful packet filtering firewalls. Um, they operate slightly different, but they only operate at layer three and four with TCP or UDP, TCP IP. Uh, proxy firewalls can make decisions all the way through, all the way up to five and seven. So they can actually see into the data stream and make decisions based on data itself. You'd never get that with a, a packet filter or stateful firewall. Multi-homed, multiple NICs in the traditional sense, that's how firewalls were, you know, are, is multi-homed systems with multiple NICs configured to multiple networks. Here's a packet filter firewall. Packet filters can maintain no context of the network traffic, so they have no idea uh, if this is a packet is a response to another packet other than by um, 
the flags that are set in the headers. So um, I could send a reply to something that I never received a response from because there's no state maintained in the firewall. So it was easy to bypass uh, packet filtering firewalls because I could send my data as a response to something and the firewall would say, oh, okay, you must have already been communicating with somebody. Uh, simple, fast, no concept of state. Uh, can't put past packets into context with the other packets. Uh, pretty easy to bypass. And there's just an example there. Uh, stateful packet inspection firewalls or state, stateful firewalls uh, do maintain a state. So if there was a reply coming from the outside, the firewall would see, is this a reply to, an, you know, was there a SYN packet before the SYN act came? You know, it would, it would maintain that state. Uh, a little harder, well, actually much harder to get past, but still uh, passable. Uh, slower, a little bit slower because I have to maintain that state and do a little bit of processing on each packet that comes across the firewall. Proxy firewalls, look in uh, proxy firewalls, just like the word proxy, the proxy means act on the behalf of, proxy firewalls terminate the session from the client, initiate a new session with the server, and vice versa. Right, so they actually terminate on the proxy firewall. Uh, and there's a good example down there. See, everybody's getting tired, man. And it's, and it's not because it's Thursday, it's because this is exciting. I don't know what to do to make it happy and exciting for everybody. Uh, ripping through it, yeah, you gotta, you gotta kind of suck it up and just push on through. Huh? That's not working. Yeah, that's not working. All right, application layer proxy firewalls, just like it says, application layer proxy firewalls, they see all the way up to layer seven. Uh, they see the entire, uh, the entire communication stream. Uh, so they can make decisions on the application layer data, such as the HTTP traffic, such as keywords in, in the HTTP traffic. So you can do web filtering uh, with a application layer proxy firewall. They do have to understand the protocols that they're proxying because they have to understand how to, how to read what it's seeing. Uh, so it would have to, um, oftentimes in a micro sense, there are, there's a proxy for each protocol, maybe within the context of a larger proxy firewall. Uh, so I have to understand the, the, the protocol uh, that's proxy, dedicated proxies are often required for each protocol, allows tighter control filtering decisions. You would expect this to be also a little slower. Sox, pro, uh, so Sox is old. Anybody seen any Sox proxies anytime, anytime recently? Sox proxies, you had to, you have, you'd have a Sox client that would allow you to communicate. They operate at layer five, that's the session layer. Uh, circuit level proxies, filter more protocols, and so on and so forth. Uh, the thing about Sox is if you see Sox, it was a circuit level proxy firewall that operated at layer five. Use TCP port 1080. Some applications had to be soxified. That sounds pretty 2000 ish or 99 ish to me. Uh, Sox 5 is the current version of the protocol. I wonder if there actually is a current version of the, of the protocol. You should look that up while you're sitting there. Is there a current version of Sox? Oh, does anybody know if there's a current version of Sox? Yeah, I'd be surprised. I can't imagine why, where you would put that or why. Uh, but they can make filtering decisions on that higher level data, like layer six, layer seven. So um, primarily layer seven is where you'd be, you know, see the data. Uh, firewall designs, so bastion hosts. Uh, most people don't refer to them necessarily as bastion hosts. Basically, actually there's a, I think I've got another, no, right. Uh, bastion hosts, kind of sacrificial systems. You put them out there, they need to be really hardened uh, otherwise, they, they will be compromised, but they're not protected by anything. Uh, we would use a lot of Bastion hosts for the old downloads of like uh, PaintShop Pro back in the day. Um, if you ever, because it was big on shareware. So we had, you know, FTP servers all over the place and they were, there was no firewall to protect them. If you didn't harden them enough, they ended up being um, wares servers. So people, you know, Attackers were storing their uh, audio file. You know, MP3s was big back then. Uh, so was uh, 
uh, pirated um, movies, right? So you, you would know how your server was was compromised because there'd be a bunch of that stuff on it when you had when we, when we were doing this stuff. <coughs> they usually provide a specific service. So in the case of the example I just used, uh, it was to download our software. And all we would do when it was compromised is just rebuild it, just reapply the build. Uh, we also, some of us uh, would also watch the movies. You know, it's like, sweet, we got compromised again. Let's check out the movies. Don't do that anymore. And well, now I signed the ethics thing, right? So I can't do it anymore. Uh, so that's that's the bastion host. Uh, dual home toast is just the traditional firewall in the middle, two NICs, you know, trusted, untrusted. That's the dual home host. Two network interfaces, one connected to the trusted network, the other connected to the untrusted network. The host does not route because it needs to make some processing. So in a traditional sense, it's not routing. A uh, user wishing to access the trusted network from the internet, we need to log into the dual home host first. Um, common design before, I guess, in the 90s. Uh, screen host architecture, uh, older flat network design. You can see the diagram there. Uh, not really used anywhere anymore. We've got the screening router that would be just doing packet filtering with an access control list. No stateful uh, filtering happening. Uh, very easy to bypass. <clears throat> More things about the screen host architecture, bastion host, whatever. You guys can see the diagram. It's not used. DMZs are used. We traditionally want all of the internet exposed systems to be on DMZ networks and we want some restrictions between the DMZ network and the internal network. And I just had a discussion with a large organization that had a video server in their DMZ. It was like a video system and uh, had a, a uh, critical severity vulnerability. Was that one that you did? That was the other man. Okay, the other, the other man did that one? Okay. Yeah, so I got a critical severity vulnerability, and it's like, well, it's just a video server, and it's provided by um, the vendor, and there's you know nothing we can do about it, and and the end it's in the DMZ. I'm like, well, what's between the DMZ? I mean, what's what's stopping from the DMZ to the internal network? What ports are open? He didn't have an answer. I'm like, well, that tells you something there, right? So not, having the DMZ and not restricting traffic sufficiently between the DMZ and the internal network doesn't really do you much good, right? We put it in the DMZ because we kind of, we're kind of sacrificing that system a little bit more because we're exposing it to internet traffic. We want that system to be hardened, uh, but we also want to restrict traffic, you know, to the next network. And some companies have multiple DMZs. Uh, but anyway, the DMZ is kind of that place where it's not the internet, which is like the wild west, but it's not my internal network, which is, you know, like, you know, Little House on the Prairie. It's that place in between. Your internal network's like Little House on the Prairie, right? <laughs> Everybody's just happy. All the computers are getting along nice. It's a nice GUI center. It is, yeah. Most, yep, yeah, most internal networks are GUI centers. Uh, so hosts receive that traffic from the untrusted networks, such as the internet, should be placed on DMZ networks designed uh, with the assumption that the DMZ host may be compromised, and if that happens, uh, the damage is limited should be hardened. There's a classic DMZ. So the classic DMZ, you'll notice one thing that's different from what we see in today's DMZs is a classic DMZ had two firewalls, right? You'd have uh, the external firewall and the internal firewall. Uh, you could make the case, I suppose, that, that, that that's more secure, uh, but that's not how we're doing it today. Uh, there was actually a DOD network that I was, I had, I had to help design and implement where there were multiple layers. There were multiple layers of DMZ. So it was get through that DMZ, get to this DMZ, get to this. And they had multiple firewalls on each side, but they had to be from multiple different vendors, manufacturers. So it may be Cisco, Sidewinder, whatever, whatever, you know what I mean? So it was very, it, it was so complex that I, I think it was probably less secure than if you just had gone with one manufacturer because the complexity of managing it was such a pain in the ass that, yeah, I mean, like <clears throat> I had to get, I, had, I, I would do the Cisco firewall and then I'd have to get so-and-so to do the Sidewinder and it, you know what I mean? It's just so easy to make mistakes because there are so many steps in the process. <clears throat> that could also apply here, right? 
the more complex we make this thing, the harder it is potentially to secure. So we don't see them like that anymore, but that's the traditional. This is what we see today, right? The three-legged DMZ, where you've got one firewall. It's got three NICs, essentially. DMZ, internal, external. That's, that's much more popular now. Uh, DMZ network screen host. So understanding what those networks are and what DMZs are and what they're used for is all going to be important for the test. Modems. Talk about legacy, right? I, I can't remember the last time I've seen a modem. So just for that, I gave you a picture of what one used to look like. <laughs> remember playing Oregon Trail? <laughs> Yeah, back in the day. Well, okay, so modems, modulator, demodulator is what they're used, is what it's meant for. It's basically taking analog <clears throat> and putting it in the data and back and forth, or analog to uh, digital and then back and forth. So bina binary data is modulated into an analog sound. So we remember those, what those look like. Uh, that can be carried on a phone networks, carrying a, home, a human voice. Now all voice network, not all, but most voice networks are all digital anyway. Uh, receiving modem then modulates the analog signal back to the binary data, the digital data. Asynchronous, asynchronous devices, they don't operate with a clock signal. Uh, clock signals are important when we start talking about, uh, like frame relay, would, the ISDN was clocked. We can talk about TSUs and CSU, DSUs, that stuff. Here, actually. So data terminational, so these, these were terms that were used, they're not so much used anymore. We don't necessarily relate to this as much as we used to. Uh, but again, if these are terms that come up, the terms still apply, we just don't refer to them like this anymore. So DTEs was like my home stuff, right? My computers were data terminal equipments. Uh, data circuit terminating equipment was stuff like the ISP uh, might maintain for me. Uh, like a router, you know, I mean, it is data circuit terminating, whereas I'm data terminating, right? The data stops at the client, but the other systems that forward on data would be this data circuit terminating equipment or data communications uh, equipment. So you'll see them referred to as DTE and DTC, but you understand the difference between DTE and DTC. Just knowing that DTE is data terminal equipment, that's the end host kind of things. Data circuit terminating equipment would have been like the routers. Uh, the things that forwarded data on. They terminated maybe the circuit, but not the data itself. CPE, not it. CPE, customer premise equipment? Uh, maybe. I mean, sometimes you'll have, you would have DCE stuff on, you know, be CPE stuff too, right? Because it might be on premise. Yeah, I don't know if that applies, but the same kind of stuff, you know, same kind of uh, letters, acronyms for everything. Did you guys see my acronyms for PUDs? You saw my PUDS article, PUDS. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. It's just another acronym for you. you pick up dog. Oh. Yeah, it's stuff that we see all the time every day and, and, and that just irritates me, right? Like just basic security stuff. And then, uh, so I was complaining to a, a coworker of mine and he's like, you know, maybe they just don't see it. And I thought back to like, a conversation I had with my wife like a week and a half ago. She called a family meeting. I don't know if you ever had a family meeting at your house. But a family meeting is like, oh, crap, what I do? So they had a family meeting, and the family meeting was, you know, helping out more around the house and all that stuff. And I was like, can you give me, like, an example? I mean, I'm trying. It's not like I would purposely not help you around the house. She goes, what about the dog crap on the top of the basement stairs? We never go down to the basement anymore because all the kids are out of the house. And I'm like, oh, that? How long has that been there? She's like, it's been there a week. So the point is, just like I didn't even notice the dog crap, you know, I don't think a lot of times people don't notice the security dog crap. So I created a, another acronym called PUDS, pick up, pick up dog. If you don't know where all your, it was kind of a funny article. It's like, if you don't know where all your uh, dog crap is, you know, hire a PUDS expert, you know, and do a PUDS or do a, <laughs> Dog, a dog crap assessment. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Uh, so DS, DCEs mark the end of the ISPs network. So that's the things that they're responsible for. The DTEs would be what you're responsible for. Uh, those things do require a clock signal in these in these environments. 
the clocking signal will be done by the channel service unit, data service unit, which is now just called terminal service unit. If you see these anywhere, these are just called TSUs now. Uh, yeah, memorization stuff, probably not stuff you're dealing with on a regular basis. Here's stuff that you'll do with on a regular basis. This is important, intrusion detection and prevention systems, right? Uh, intrusion detection systems essentially are just detecting. There's no active something that they do but by based on the stuff that they're detecting. It's like that commercial, the LifeLock commercial. We got the guard who's standing and he's getting robbed. <clears throat> like, did you see that commercial? Really? There's a bank robbery going on and there's a guard there and he's got a, you know, he's an armed guard and the bank robbers are coming in and he goes, you're getting robbed. He's like, aren't you going to do anything? He goes, no, I'm a, I'm a monitor, not a, you know, I don't know, not a, yeah, like I don't respond. That's like intrusion detection. They just monitor. They don't do anything. Intrusion prevention systems, you, that commercial is kind of funny. Intrusion prevention systems, those would actually take an action based on, you know, the rules that they've been set up to do. Uh, two basic types of IDSs and IPSs, we call them NIDs and NIPs, or HIDs or HIPs, right? Network-based or host-based. Is that what that's on there? Uh, for most of the examples reference IDSs for simplicity. All right, but they play they apply the same way. They operate the same way. The only thing that's really different between a, a HID or a NID and a NIP uh, is the act, you know, something happens based on the data. But the same kind of uh, functions apply up to that point. So NIDs and NIPs we detect uh, malicious traffic on a network. The, you know, know what they stand for. So network-based intrusion detection and intrusion prevention system. You can see some architectural, you know, little pieces over there. The one on the top, that's a detection system because it's not, you know that that's a detect, well, it could be a prevention system. If it was taking an activity, we call that uh, shooting down the traffic. But traditionally, IPSs were in line with the data stream. Uh, so that one's definitely a, a NIPS down there. Uh, so you require promiscuous mode network access in order to analyze the traffic. If you just put it, plug a, a network intrusion detection system into a switch port, it's only going to see broadcast traffic and the thing that's on, this, on that switch port, right? Because that's the only thing that gets forwarded down there. So going back to that's why I would do use a tap or use a span port. Passive devices that do not interfere with the traffic. Yeah and the NIPs would alter the traffic. They would make decisions on that. Two types of NIPs, uh, active response and inline. The active response is one where the, the network intrusion prevention system isn't in line with the network traffic, but it's monitoring. It's like a, it's really like a network intrusion detection system with some triggering in it, right? So it might send a, uh, a FIN packet, right? You know, if there's attack traffic, I'm gonna shut down the traffic and send a FIN packet so that these two hosts stop communicating. That would be uh, an active response. Uh, yeah, monitoring face read write may shoot down malicious traffic. Inline means that the traffic flows through it. Uh, snort is the popular. Have you used Snort before? <clears throat> you can go down this. It's free. It's Snort is actually a really pretty quality uh, intrusion detection system. Still very popular and very well ma maintained. <coughs> Uh, so if you're looking for a free network intrusion detection system, SNORT might be an option. Uh, false positive on a network intrusion prevention system obviously is more damaging than one. And so what we traditionally see is people are afraid to kind of flip the switch from intrusion detection into to intrusion prevention. I've seen Cisco, uh, you know, uh, uh, modules. I can't even think of the name now. Source yeah, I'd see, I've seen them in learning mode for years right or which is essentially intrusion detection it's, a, it's just it's not doing anything because uh, if you get it wrong right it's going to shut down potentially shut down traffic so you know make sure that before you implement or use a network intrusion prevention system that it's it's going to be tuned properly used to take for an intrusion detection system to actually provide any value it was a good six to nine month tuning process so you'd have to tune out all the false positives and false negatives. Uh, so there's a lot of noise. Not so much anymore. 
host-based intrusion detection and intrusion prevention system, it's the same thing just on the host instead of on the, on the network. Tripwire. Now, uh, Symantec, I mean, there's so many different products now that do host-based intrusion detection and prevention. So the way they work, pattern matching protocol behavior, anomaly detection, uh, pattern matching is, it's a signature based. So uh, it's dependent upon the signatures that have been configured on the, on the device. Oftentimes they'll download the signatures from the vendor. Uh, that type of detection has the least amount of false positives uh, because it's, it's, uh, it, it matches a specific pattern. So it works for that comparing events to static signatures, works well for detecting known attacks, doesn't do anything really for the newer attacks that there's no, if there's no signature written for it, it's not going to do anything. Uh, the other one, the protocol behavior, really that's around protocols are designed to operate in this way. If it doesn't operate in this way, then it must be, or maybe it's something bad. Uh, they use RFCs usually for, uh, for protocol behavior. Anomaly detection is it build a baseline of network traffic that what's normal for this network. Anything that deviates, you know, uh, over anything that deviates is an anomaly. And so, how, depending on how I've tuned it, then I'd be alerted on. Would you call that heuristic? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, somewhat. Yep. Yeah, so those types of detection, and those are that's pretty much how they're working. So the pattern matching protocol behavior or anomalies. Honeypots. Honeypots are pretty cool. Um, anybody ever played with a honeypot before? Take a when you go when you go home tonight. No. <laughs> Just build a Windows XP system, and put it out there, and see what happens. Now, honeypots are used to attract attackers, and the purpose is for research, right? We want to see what types of attacks that they're conducting, you know, what's successful, what's their methods, uh, and the purpose is so that we can build better defenses against it. Uh, so designed to attack, attract attackers, uh, you know, you might leave a uh, vulnerability, you know, purposely in it to see if the attacker can find it and what they're going to do with it. Uh, yep. So allows researchers to de defend better. Uh, a honey net is just a bunch of honey pots. Uh, no production value beyond research. You should consult with legal before doing this because what happens is if that honeypot, they compromise the honeypot and then they in turn compromise something else. Is it enticement or is it an entrapment when it goes to court? Uh, so if you're going to prosecute, especially if your honeypot was used as a pivot to attack somebody else and then it becomes a criminal, <coughs> criminal matter, uh, then you might get drug in on this as a, uh, for that too. So consult with legal before you deploy a honeypot. If you want to participate uh, or learn more, honeynet.org is a good place to learn more about honeypots and how to set them up. You can find some uh, images here too that you can build. This That's not on the test, honeynet, but if you want to go, if you're, if you're interested in those things. Uh, Network attacks, uh, okay, yeah, you, again, you're going to see attacks in, in the exam that are, <clears throat> they don't work anymore. And I think the reason, there's two purposes for that. The same principles sort of apply, and you don't really want in a book like this to teach people attacks that actually work, right? That's a different class. It's not this one. Uh, so the original definition of a hacker is someone who uses technology in ways that creators did not attend. So hackers, I think what happened was, you get a lot of uh, researchers who have um, low self-esteem. They don't want to be called hackers. I mean, I, <clears throat> I always find this funny, like hackers, crackers, black hat, white hat, like because crackers don't mind being called hackers, but hackers don't want to be called crackers, you know, and some hackers don't want to be called hackers because everybody thinks that hackers are bad. So we've got to set the record straight. Hackers may not be bad. Hackers might just be researchers who like to push the envelope and try out new things. I think the PC term is ethical hacker. Ethical hacker. Yeah, air quotes. You have to do air quotes, too, if you want to be real PC. Yeah, so the original definition of a hacker is that countless ways, I mean, seriously, there's so many ways to, uh, to attack networks. Uh, you can ask you know, our penetration testers who do it every day. 
So TCP SYN flood, this was a denial service attack. The way a TCP SYN flood would work is you would just continue, you'd send SYN packets and then the host would send a SYN, a SYN ACK back and then I would never send the ACK back, right? So it would hold open the buffer basically waiting for that ACK to come back. And if I sent enough of those over enough time, it would crash the system or it wouldn't be able to uh, accept any more connections. And so back in the day, like NT days, Windows NT four days, that would work. NT service pack three stopped it from working. So it, it tells you how long ago that was. <clears throat> so SYN packets, uh, but the, the concept, you, you know, you understand the concept, right? And why that's a SYN flood. Land attack would just be send a syst, I would spoof the source to be your address, right? So I, you know, if your address is 192.168.01 and mine, <clears throat> mine is whatever, I would send a packet to you with a source address of 192.168.01. So I'd have a source and a destination of the same address. And then you'd try to reply back, you'd be replying back to yourself. And that's in another packet and you'd be trying to reply back to yourself. So you just keep opening these connections with yourself and then eventually you crash. And that's, that's the land attack. That doesn't work anymore either. Smurf and Fraggle attacks. These are the same, essentially the same types of attacks. The, 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 Fraggle, uh, the Smurf attack was ICMP. The Fraggle was UDP. You'll need to know that for the exam. Neither of these attacks work anymore. I, I've never, yeah, I don't think that they would work because everybody is filtering uh, directed broadcasts now uh, on the on the routers. Uh, but the way it would work was, let's say I wanted to attack Matt, I would ping a broadcast, a directed broadcast network, a large one, and I would spoof the source address as being Matt. So then all these hosts, you know, thousands of hosts would reply back with their ICMP echo uh, reply to Matt and Matt would get flooded with network traffic and it would put him offline. That's a Smurf attack, right? Thing is everybody's stopping directed broadcasts now. So that attack wouldn't work. And plus the computing power of Matt's system could handle the traffic. It wouldn't be a big deal, but that's the way that works. So it was a denial service stack, directed broadcast IP addresses, You'd ping the directed uh, broadcast address with a spoofed source of the person I'm trying to attack. Uh, and that's who would get, you know, kind of knocked offline. They called an asymmetric attack. We would also sometimes call this as a, uh, you know, uh, like a mirror attack, you know, because it's essentially mirroring the traffic to somebody else. Fraggle does the same thing, essentially, except for it's using UDP instead of ICTMP. But again, these, these are all blocked now. They're not going to work. Teardrop attack, we would just mess around with the fragmentation of packets so that you would have trouble assembling them, right? Uh, so a teardrop attack essentially would have overwriting, overwriting, writing over, one packet over, overlapped, oh my God. One packet overlapped with another packet. So when you tried to reassemble the data, you wouldn't know what to do and you'd blue screen. Uh, so denial service attack rely, relying on fragmentation reassembly. An attacker sends multiple large overlapping IP fragments. The system crashes when it tries to put it back together again. Because it just, it doesn't make sense. Quick question from online. Is this all testable? Yeah. Those yeah. Yeah, because I think conceptually they're they're pretty cool, you know, and they're, and they're pretty... Uh, they're still there, there are still reflection attacks and there are still, I mean, and the point here is that if you monkey around with things the way they're not supposed to work, you know, that you can do bad things. And so that kind of stuff still works. These are all well-known attacks that I think most network admins you know, have heard of before or seen before. So yeah, they'll be on the exam. So that's it. We made it through domain four. I didn't see any of you fall asleep. I saw some eyes. I saw some white, like this rolling back like that. I think it's funny. Uh, but you know, we're past halfway so far. Uh, you know, um, we're done with the telecommunication. It used to be called telecommunications, now it's communication network security. We're done with this domain. Read up on it, um, you know, master it. 
you know, if you're uh, if you're an IT person with a strong technical background, you know, probably don't even have to read it. Uh, so, but that's our homework for Tuesday. It is supposed to be nice this weekend, so hopefully you guys enjoy it in Minnesota. Uh, we're going to start in on Domain Five, Identity and Access Management, which is a huge, grave opportunity for security people, you know, in the real world. And that's it. So, thank you. Any questions online? All right, we're good. Have a good night, everybody.